yeah. and also uh, the battery. Oh. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just, I just, I just, just I just, I just, I just, I just, I I was just, 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 I I think you'll be able to dance to 2.2 if you really want to. Yeah, but like, it's, it's well to play around with like, yeah. Yeah. Well, so, the others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, one more? I'm sorry. Uh, no. So, yeah, I can be here. Actually, that was funny. Yeah. 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 There was another one thing I can't remember. Oh, we did. Yeah, this is where you saw the picture, which is like, yeah. Yeah. And it's like, chocolate stuff or eight. Yeah, like, I was having a short power because I had a story. It's just a general standard, yeah. right? MP4, yeah. it's MP4, I might use a different code. Yeah, we could just convert so it. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Thank you for doing that. Oh, absolutely. If there's any issue, I'll slip them down. Oh, no, oh, no, 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 Yeah, 
Okay, so welcome back from Spring Break, everybody. Glad to see you. Thank you, and I got signals from the audience. <laughs> good. Uh, good to see you. Um, I had a class on Monday morning, the day after Spring Break, and everybody was hung over. So you look a lot better. <laughs> So, yes, yeah, so, so what we want to present actually, it has just my name on it, but it's really a group effort, and we still have to change that. It's a talk that we want to give at a conference next week on Thursday. And I'm glad to inform you that it's all still a work in progress and the building side. Uh, but we'll sort of, we'll, since we're all friends here, we'll just show you the initial cases of it and all of the, the, the state as this. And I have this one. So, um, so the, the, the talk is actually at a conference for new market computing, and we want to make it sort of organized by the semiconductor industry. And um, the idea is we want to convince people that looking at bats is a very good model for seeing how you can actually take a, a, a neuromorphic computer. So you, you try to model the brain for your computing. How can you actually put it into a meaningful context so that it can do something in the real world, right? And so the bats, having this steady mobility and a relatively small brain, right? So because the bad, typical bad brain is 0. something gram, right? So with 0. something gram of brain mass, you can navigate in 3D and see in the night, right? And so that, that should be a way uh, to do that. So uh, here we have a video, actually, that, that still, this hasn't been put into the slide yet. So this all the, and then we have a, Right there, and it's actually a video that Xiao Yan made. Uh, is that right? I remember that right. You made it that you made that. You still have to, yeah, it's yours. Yeah, yeah, okay. It was on my heart, right? But I wonder where it came from. Okay, good. So we'll acknowledge you. And so the idea is to see, look, and um, there's a lot going on in the periphery, right? So it's not just about when, when, that the brains are so capable, it's not just a matter of um, the brain, uh, but there are sort of things that are done like when the sound comes out of the nostril here. You see this is changing shape and the ears receive the sound, they are changing shape. So a lot of the thinking that the bats do, they probably do it with their nose leaf and with their ears, right? And the idea is if you really want to replicate what the bats can do, then you have to, oh, okay. Maybe that is the um, um, so the um, so, so you have to replicate all those things, right? So the, the nose and the ear and then and, and the brain. Okay. Good, and so as you all know here, but the people there will not know, so we have quite a bit of history of building little robotic pets that try to mimic the nose leaf and try to mimic the ears. And that is somewhat an older sort of the T-Rex, or not quite the T-Rex, but somewhere early mammal right, of, the, of, the, of the robotic pet heads. And then we want to have a slide about the data, or oh, obviously I don't know the slides. And, but the idea of the slides, yet, but the idea is that we really want to cover all the degrees of freedom that those ears of a bat or nose leaves have. Right? So if you compare 
what pets do when they emit and perceive ultrasound to fit into what technical systems do. But the one thing if you take your ear is just the rotation, right? So you, you change the direction. And that's obviously something that we do a lot if you look at the radar antenna or a satellite dish or, or uh, some, something that tracks a satellite here. But they, there's often they sit on a pen tilt unit and they rotate. So that's nothing new to engineering. It makes sense, right? If I go on to listen to over there, I have to turn my, my efforts here, here. And if I'm over there, it, it should turn it over there, right? So all these things, um, that's, that's understood. What the vets also do, this is a cross section through the ear at two different times, but is that they actually change the shape of the ear. And that is something that no radar, no satellite, no sonar, nothing does yet. Right? So that's a great degree of freedom that vets have that we, we have not incorporated yet. And the third thing, uh, so this, this colorful plot here on the ear that actually encodes motion speeds. Right, so the ear, when it moves, it moves fast enough so that it triggers a nonlinear effect, the Doppler effect, but if you have an ambulance coming by, and that kind of thing. The ears of the bed move fast enough, but you can do an ear motion in a tenth of a second. So the ears move fast enough that they actually make those Doppler shifts. So we also have a nonlinear <coughs> transform, also something that is not done in, in any technical system yet. So we try to get closer and closer to that. So this is so uh, flashed from earlier this week, this uh, senior design team that is working on the next version of the solar head. And you can see that what we are doing is uh, to make this whole thing um, so the soft robotic, right, the pneumatic actuators. So a bat has a bit more than 20 muscles on an ear. So with this senior design team, they have made it to one, two, three, four. Right? So that's, that's not bad, right? That's 20% that's of the of what the bat has. And the question is, of course, how many do you do you use? But I'm, I'm really happy from the from the T-Rex to hear how this system has has evolved. And uh, so we can probably get much more control here and can, can do much more interesting adaptive things with that. The other thing that we have been working on is actually to get real data. Right? So one is you want, if you want to understand how the bats do it in quotation mark, right? you have to have the um, you have to have the, the reproduction of the bed, but you also need to understand what is the input, right? And uh, the input is in the natural environment. So our team here uh, last fall, uh, uh, the, uh, everybody but me, I, I just came for the photo, right? um, did a lot of walking in the woods and, and record about 220,000 echoes from the forest on the campus, right? And so because, because each echo is different, right? You really need to have a large data set to get a sense of the variability, right? You cannot just say, oh, I have this one echo here. And the idea that I have, it works wonderfully with this one echo, right? Because the next echo will be very different, right? So you need something that works uh, throughout, right? If you want to fly along this path here, right? So that's the path that the solar head took. Uh, um, if you want to fly along this path, you'd better have a method to process the echoes that works here and here and here and here, and the echoes are, are, are very different. So based on this data set, we have then started to work on neuromorphic signal representation. Shall I also do that and then you take over? Or, yeah. Good. Um, so we have worked on <coughs> neuromorphic, so brain-inspired representations for the for the signal, right? So we take our sonar head, the periphery, the little silicone wiggling ears, and uh, we feed it the stimulus from the environment, and we have a model or models for the inner ear, right? So that's sort of the first step, how the, the signal, the acoustic signal, is converted into the language of the brain. So how do we do that? And Omar is going to talk about that. And we have a, have a model for the inner hair cell. That's really something where we haven't, it's sort of just a glue between the model, right? So that's the first cell that makes a signal. Uh, so we didn't care about that. But then we have to think, right, what's the, in the language of the brain, right? The brain talks with little electrical impulses. Uh, so what, what would then happen? And then the goal is to, to close this loop and have a controller that then controls the periphery of the head, right? So that's how we think we can make a really powerful a uh, neuromorphic system here that has periphery, that has uh, an artificial brain inside and, and can close the loop and be more adaptive, right? And so for each one, there's some, some examples here what the stuff looks like, but we'll cover that in detail. So Omar, why don't you come up and you talk about the basal membrane models.
Hi, uh, we adopted three BM models. So the complexity of those models uh, range from simple to complex. The simplest one is the gamma one. Then the a bit more complex one is the gamma chart, and the most complex one is the DRNL. So which the, means dual, dual resonance nonlinear BM model. Okay. So the gamma tone is linear, it's level independent, and it has symmetric band pass filter. With the, the level independent means uh, the output of the gamma tone or SPM models, it uh, doesn't depend on the intensity of the signal. And the gamma chart is almost same as the gamma tone. The major difference is the gamma tone is symmetric and this one is asymmetric. On the other hand, the most complex one, which is a dual resonance nonlinear model, DRNL, this is uh, both nonlinear as well as the level dependent, which means uh, the output of this model depends uh, on the intensity of the signal. So, this is uh, two, two linear models, uh, the, how they are different from each other. So the first one is that the top one is the gamma tool and the bottom one is the gamma chart. So we could see uh, we could see the difference between the gamma tool and gamma chart in terms of symmetric. The first one is symmetric and the second one is asymmetric. And the third model is the, the dual resonance nonlinear DRNL model. So DRNL has two paths. One is the linear path and another one is non-linear path. And the output of the RNL is the summation of both, both paths. So the, the top one, which is linear path, uh, it works on if the intensity of the signal is pretty high. And the non-linear part, uh, I mean, it, it works means it dominates uh, the whole uh, output of the DRNL. The linear path uh, dominates when the intensity of the signal is pretty high, and the nonlinear path dominates when the intensity of the signal is low. To give an example, is you could see here when the intensity of the signal was low, which was uh, 20 dB, we could see the nonlinearity in the uh, in the model, and when the intensity was quite high, it's almost same as the gamma tone or the gamma chart. So as I said, when the intensity was low, the nonlinear uh, non path dominates. When the intensity is quite high, the linear path dominates. So why would that be? So uh, this is uh, this model is uh, these three models based on uh, we adopted these models from human auditory system. So that's how basically the auditory system works. But physically, what does it mean? Can you... uh, it means, let's say, if we have uh, two different kind of sounds, one is really high intense, so another is really low intense. So to process the high intense sound, we might not need that much of uh, processing. So we can do it easily, for example, with the gamma tone. So we do not need if we go back here. So it's the top one, the linear part, the top one, it's the it's almost the same as the gamma tone on the gamma chart. So if the intensity is quite high, uh, we do not need much processing here, not much amplification or uh, reduction, something. But if the intensity is quite low, we need you could see the broken sticky nonlinearity this part. And the intensity is really low, so it has some kind of amplification here. So it does something to amplify the signal so that we could hear or we could process really uh, low intense signal. So, so the, the filter is nonlinear. Yeah, the output the, is yeah. the filter is nonlinear. Yeah. Overall. Overall, right? the overall. So if uh, if we get let's say if we we have in, in between uh, the intense intensity of the signal is not too high it's not too low then we could get the combination of both if you look at it both paths ways yeah. right mostly it's all linear components right the top is everything is linear and then non-linear path is also mostly linear with the exception of this broken stick which means a function about right, two linear segments right is this broken stick non-linearity so that's the only thing 
And so the model, the shift between, or the weighting between them, that's a parameter. Yeah. Right? Yes. So the model senses the input amplitude, and then it, it, it weighs these different paths. That's how the model does it. So the model looks at the signal, say, that's a high intensity, I set the weight like that. That's a low intensity, I set the weight like this. That's how the model does it. Yeah. The physics in the real system is that you, or what people think it is, is that you have uh, uh, active amplifiers in the inner ear, and they sense the level and then behave differently. But that's, that's what people think happens in the real world. Okay. So uh, as Dr. Mueller said, we uh, collected uh, 220k data from forest. So we analyzed those data uh, initially with differential entropy. So the, the output of each model, from the output of each model, we calculated the differential entropy. So what we can see here is the dynamic has more entropy compared to the static. Uh, if you see, this is the difference basically between the dynamic and static, so which is all the time, most of the time positive, which means the dynamic has more entropy than the static. So it is also noticed, we could also notice that the DRNL, so which is uh, this dot, dot line, so DRNL has more entropy compared to the gamma tune and the gamma charm. That's Maybe quickly to explain, right? Entropy, the idea is that it gives you an, um, a measure of how much um, encoding, how much sensory information you can encode. But so the more entropy the channel has, the more <laughs> possibility to send information you have. Right? And so, so we wanted to know if we wiggle the ear, right, do we get more information in it? And I find it quite astonishing, right? If that if that was just one echo, right? And we had found such an example. But you do that over 220,000 echoes, so that they all look very different. They come from the forest, right? Lots of things. And yet you see a clear difference here. Uh, so I think that's actually quite amazing that that shines through here. So that was the part, yeah. So that was the part on the, on the modeling, the inner ear. And now David will talk about the spikes. Uh, so the, yeah, yeah, yeah. So from this, this was computed on all the echoes together? Uh, it's almost all the echoes, not all, but a major. A, lot, a very large set. A very large set. But they come in different tracks, and yeah. then tracks different where tracks. we have just a few steps, we discard them. So it's less than the 220,000, yeah. but yeah, it's enough. It, it, it's, it's a really it's large set. So then, after the basilar membrane model, we so we have the, this uh, translation between the mechanical vibration in frequency, the electrical uh, concept in the inner hair cell. So we have now a current that we can integrate in a few spike models. So we implemented two different spike models, and the idea is to have a, a time footprint of our signal. Uh, in terms of spikes, so in, in our artificial brain, how many spikes do we have? So the first model that we computed is Zeke Integrated Empire. It's a simple integration of the current uh, with a static threshold and three parameters, which are uh, the resistance, membrane resistance, or M, the, the time constant, and uh, as I said, the, the, the threshold. And uh, to have a more complex model, and and to know which one is more suitable for our purpose. We computed the response kernels, which is more uh, complex because it, it implements the after potential. So after spikes, we have uh, uh, something more realistic about regarding what the neurons do, uh, which means the refractoriness after the spike. So we have more uh, parameters. We have three additional parameters, which are uh, there, is, there is a potential, uh, a refractoriness time constant and a recovery time constant. So more parameters, so the computation is, is uh, a bit uh, lower. And then, uh, as Omar did, like with the same purpose, how many uh, information are encoded in our spike train? 
So we did, we calculated the entropy, and uh, we know that all of these uh, six parameters play uh, a role in, in the spike train. And we don't know, we don't know which parameter is more optimized. So we did an optimization of each parameter based on the entropy. The, the, the goal is, we know that between dynamic and static territory, we have different amounts of information encoding in the spike train. So we need to align this difference uh, in the information. So we did uh, an, an entropy calculation with information theoretic analysis. And here is an example of how, how do we choose the, 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 the best um, membrane resistance value. So here's the entropy, the, the, the orange curve is the total entropy. And we see in the bar, red bar the difference between dynamic and static. And the first thing, thing is, it is always positive, whatever the value of the membrane resistance, dynamic uh, has more information encoded in the spike trend than static directory. So here is by using the leak integrated identifier. And uh, we came up with an optimized membrane resistance of 20 mega. And we did uh, the same thing for each uh, parameter. You're, so you're modeling this based on the idea of these are action potentials. Correct, yeah. Why not do it based on a graded potential? So the idea is in an action potential, you measure it in the axon, you know, big signal is a lot of spikes. Okay. The actual hair cells are innervated by the dendrites, and those are producing graded. Okay. This translated in the soma of the neuron, the axon hillage. It's translated into an action potential. Okay, so instead of action potential, yeah. Well, it's just—it's a different way of thinking yeah. about it, okay. and I don't know—I don't know one's better or worse. It's, it's a good point. So I was at the same conference last year, and there was exactly that debate. Right? When we build artificial brains, should they should we do spikes at all? Is this really just something that the brain has to do? Well, right? one reason we do it is because you can send a signal a long distance, yeah. and it doesn't degrade. Exactly. Yeah, because yeah, that, that's—I mean—that's how I explain it also in my class. But it is because that the brain. We don't have copper cables. We don't have nice insulation. So we have to um, boost the signal. Right? And the spike, underlying the spike, is a self-stimulating positive feedback process. So that's very nice to get it going. So one thought about spikes is that they are just a crutch that the brain has to use because it has bad cables. Right? And so it's essentially, anything you could do, you could do it just as well with the original analog signal, right? So that's view A. But view B is that somehow the spy code is actually a very clever way of encoding the information, right? And, and that's particular, I mean, you alluded to these situations, right, where the rate, right, so how you would count in the time window, and then you would say, I have this many spikes, and then I, um, I could just use that to code for the amplitude, right? So it's really just, a number mm -hmm. for an amplitude. So, so there's really no purpose. You could do the same thing. But, and that usually works very well if you have signals that change very slow compared to how fast the spikes can come. Now here the interesting thing is that we have ultrasonic signals, right? And they change very fast. And it also happens, right? So even the ear motion, right? One tenth of a second. And these, these bad neurons, they are not, as you would think, yeah, they are ultrasonic animals, so maybe their spikes are coming a lot faster than human brains. But the answer is no. Right? The spikes are also, at best, a few hundred hertz spike frequency. So the other word, right? so in other words, right, you have this ear motion, it's non-stationary, you shouldn't average, right? because at every position it's different. And so really at every little time window, you probably have just a few spikes. Right, so, so the brain definitely, this is a, what people call a sparse code, right? And is that really something we need? We don't know yet, right? But that, the sort of the, that, we, that David is going in that direction, we have this implicit hypothesis, it may be. Right? So we think, yeah, there might be something really clever that you just have a couple of times and, and you can tell it all, right? But we are not there yet, right? So we cannot prove that. Okay? Yes, 
idea for, like why we use the entropy analysis has already been said before but essentially uh, the first step that we will uh, why we calculate the entropy is that uh, initially we have this model and we want to compare whether the signals are like different at all and like what is the difference and can we quantify that in terms of how much information or the potential for information is there between the signals that we record especially in particularly comparing static and dynamic so with the, uh, the first method we do uh, in order to compare the signals that we do uh, process through our model is comparing the entropy using the direct entropy method of the sh it's also called Shannon's entropy and the process for that essentially is that we have our spike responses and we bend our spike responses like we just said uh, in small time bends which either contain a zero which means that a spike has not occurred or a one that a spike has occurred and once we bend uh, our signals in that way in Shandar, what we do is like we group a few time bends together to form what are essentially called words, which is essentially just a sequence of bends where you either have zeros and ones. The next step is just to keep account of how many different uh, word sequences or word combinations you observe through your data and create a histogram and that histogram is calculated so that we have a naive estimate of the probability distribution of the different words that we observe and that plugs into the fundamental uh, information theoretic measure of entropy which is just this formula where you do a summation of p log p where p is your estimated probability of a certain word sequence or any character that occurs within your data and the total result gives you an estimate of how much information it encodes. Okay. But there are some limitations of using uh, just a direct entropy method, uh, which are essentially that it is very unlikely because especially when you're creating words that are particularly long, that you would observe all the occurrences and, or you would capture the probability distribution function very accurately. So to correct for that errors, essentially due to undersampling, one method that we use is the centered Dirichlet method, uh, which is essentially a Bayesian estimate to correct for the undersampled under regime. And how we do that essentially is we just assume that for every word, like uh, in this uh, the picture on the top, let's say we see we say that when we observe no spikes that is the most likely scenario because spikes are sparse in general. And when we observe more spikes, that's less likely. And for a word that has the same number of spikes irrespective of what order they appear in, they just have the same probability of occurring, which is an assumption which allows us to create a prior in our Bayesian estimate of entropy. And once we create that prior based on this assumption, we're able to calculate the posterior probability distribution function, which is more accurate, uh, given the fact that your prior assumption is selected for neural data. The basis of that, which assumption is that spikes as well. Um, okay, so as David talked before, that we have a lot of parameters in a spike model that we can optimize to. Uh, to essentially try and maximize the entropy that we see for our signals. But, and so these, this, uh, this plot essentially shows four combinations. I haven't gone into the, so the details are the, the threshold uh, is given by the different colors in the four cases. So it's five millivolts, uh, seven, nine, and 10. Whereas the time constants that of integration that we use for a spike response models are given on the x-axis and what we see here is like the total entropy that you calculate this by the way is the mean entropy for both static and dynamic signals and the amount of information that you see uh, is affected quite a lot by how you vary the parameters because as you can see if you have a really long time constant or a really high threshold you won't see any spikes at all so there would be really no information or 
if you go to the other extreme, you just get words that are full of spikes. So there's not a lot of information there either because that's really predictable. It's all ones. And once we optimize these parameters, we can then compare the using these parameters that are selected for the selected, we can then compare the static and dynamic signals. And here are some of the you know, some of the results that we've got. So this plot compares the different basilar membrane models that we've observed and the entropy that we get with the selected parameters. So first we see gametone, uh, this gametone is the second and third is the DRNL. There is small variation in the total entropy that we see, but uh, the orange plot, the orange bar <laughs> is going to a dynamic periphery and the, this color is going to be, uh, I don't know what, yeah, the dark brown color essentially corresponds to the static no, periphery. No. Yeah, it's it's Chicago maroon. Yeah. I guess that's what we're doing. Virginia took my room. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, and that's what we got it. Uh, anyways, so we just uh, what we see and like we did this. So this is one of the examples of. Uh, uh, so because we had a lot of variables, like we had different tracks, we had different models, we had different parameters. It's difficult to show everything at once. So for this plot, I've fixed the fixed the track while I'm varying the basilar membrane models. And we see that we always get more information in dynamic compared to static. Depending upon what parameters you use, that can uh, increase or decrease. So the total entropy bit as well as the difference, but you can consistently see something like 5% difference. And the next slide is where I have control for the basal membrane models and the parameters, and I'm just weighting the tracks. So here we see three rather. Can you show the tracks? Oh, tracks is where we collected the data. Okay. Oh, it's yeah. a walk in the woods. I, I got a trial. Yeah, yeah. It's a little track yeah. of a person yeah. walking in the woods. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So here we were, yeah, I was comparing three different tracks that we were And again, what you can see is that it varies, uh, the total amount of information also varies with where the data is collected, but the, the only consistent uh, thing is that you see more entropy in the dynamic data compared to the static data, depending uh, irrespective of the fact what parameters you use or what models you use or what data you're looking at in terms of the trial. And I think that completes the presentation. Uh, oh, no. Yeah, yeah that completes my presentation. I'm here. I'm going to walk you to the next one. I'm going to the next one. So, this is about now. We'd like to Omar, David, and Ananya have talk about. We want to use our sonar head to navigate the real world. We pick up the one of the navigation tasks, which is to find the passageway in a density foliage. Uh, we build our artificial foliage with a gap in the center, and the sonar head is put on a track of a linear scanner. So this linear scanner it consists of a step motor and a timing build, which can actuate the sonar head to horizontally scan the foliage as well as the gap. So with a gap with a controllable gap width and a, a controllable distance between sonar head and the foliage, we collect a large a large number of echoes. And uh, so how does the uh, sonar head find the gaps? So here is a top view of our setup. Left side is sonar head. This is a top view of the foliage, the bay gap. This curve is a beam of our sonar head. So when the gap is large enough for the beam to fit in, we can we find that there is a drop of the amplitude of the echoes when the sonar head scans the gap. So in other words, there is uh, there is less echo energy from the gap, and it is obvious because when the gap is big enough, the sonar head uh, all, all the signals sent sent from sonar head will go through the gap without some reflections. But if we try to make the gap narrow or keep the sonar head further from the foliage, these drop features will become weaker. And if we continue to do that, little by little, the, this drop will, have, will be hidden in the noise. So here we pick up the energy, the drop of the energy as the first criterion to find this gap. And we use a raw curve to describe the performance. So here is the raw curve. The, the, the diagonal dashed line is the, the result 
is the test. And the blue line means uh, should show the result of the energy approach. So it seems like uh, the energy approach has a better result than what is, what is we are guessing. But uh, if we if we look look into the some point on the blue curve, just pick up one point like uh, 0 0.1 or 0 0.5. So what does these numbers mean? So uh, let let me explain it easier. So for example, if there's a wall like this wall, the wall is 100 meters long, and there's only one door on this wall because the door is one meters wide. So the possibility of false alarm as 10% means that with this method, with this model, it tells me that it tells me that there are totally 10 doors in this wall, uh, one door per 10 meters. So if I trust this, trust it, I have a chance to hit my head on the wall instead of going through the door. And the possibility of a hit as 50% means that uh, um, if there's really one, there's really one door in front of me on the wall, I have half chance, I still have half chance to miss it and half chance to find it. So if we consider about this, if we can see that this uh, performance for navigation task is not so good. So we have to look for a different method to find the gap. And in the second method, we use the convolution neural network, which is called CN. And I use, we use, uh, we pick up the special gram of the echo as an input, because the special gram contains the information in time domain and the frame state domain. And uh, we normalize all the echo data because we want to remove the effect of the energy. And uh, here I list some of the special gram uh, of the echoes. The top row are the, are, are the result from, um, from the quality, and the bottom are the result from the gap. So we can hardly find some differences to figure out where it is, where it is come from. So we threw this problem to the CN model, trained this model with a large number of input like this, and labeled all the input as foliage gap, foliage gap. And we have here is a result of the convolution neural network of the worker. So uh, with a possibility of force alarm around zero, the possibility of a hit for the convolution will work on most one, so which is better than the energy approach. Uh, but the convolution neural network is a black box problem a method. So we don't know what happened inside this model. We have to find out how it can figure out the gap or the foliage. So what I'm doing now is to uh, visualize the result inside the same model to see if we can find some like the rules or some features that is the same model is interested to find the gap. So I hope I can find some interesting issue in the future. <laughs> Next week. <laughs> Next week. <laughs> <laughs> Near future. Good. Okay. Thank you very much. I think that concludes. But this is really the end. So, so that's what we have so far. Thank you very much, everybody. Other questions? Okay. That's the case. And Thank you very much once again. And what do we do next week? Do we have a plan or? Well, maybe for the ASA. Uh, start already, with, yeah. Okay, good. So we'll, it's send an email. But if somebody, yeah, but okay, but I think we have somebody lined up then, right? Or, or, do you have someone you need a volunteer? Could be, yeah. So, yeah, but, but yeah, why don't you get in touch with Ray Howe and then we see and we'll, 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 we'll fit it in. Sure, sure. Uh, Who's doing me one to volunteer? Uh, okay. It's <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Good. Good. So we have a volunteer for next week. Good. Okay, good then. Thank you very much and see you the week after next because I will not be here. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>